is Aviva Jobin Leeds, and I'm reporting live from the Longfellow House. Before researching it further, I knew that this was the site where George Washington spent the first nine months of the Revolution. The website would boast that this is the place where American character and culture was developed. This was presented as a hub of American thought with a rose-colored lens. First, we went to a gift shop. Then, we went inside. Back at it again, Rose got it. Who owned the house when Washington moved here? So it had been abandoned by the vassals. So Massachusetts delegates had been writing him, writing Congress, saying that we have this big army, we can't support it. Washington is chosen. He moves into this house in July of 1775 and stays here until the beginning of April 1776. He had, I think, already started to question the institution of slavery a little bit, but not too much. 11 years old, right? I mentioned when his father died, he inherits his first people. And when Washington arrives, we don't actually have a good number of how many enslaved people were in the army, but we know they were there. There's a Pennsylvania captain named Alexander Braden who said that amongst um, the regiment there were um, Negroes, which caused some reactions from people who weren't used to seeing them. Washington wrote that he found Negroes, old men, and young boys incapable of bearing arms. I don't think he ever would have saw, I don't think he could have imagined equality of any kind, you know, legal or real or societal, but, um, but I do think he could envision a future that was different. As President of the United States, don't you think we would have heard if he had any other ideas? Next, we're going to talk about Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, who moved into this house the year before the Cherokee Nation was forcibly removed by the U.S. government. He moves into this house in 1837. He was not well known as a poet yet at this point. 1839, he publishes a book called Voices of the Night that puts him on the literary map. When he quits teaching at Harvard for the rest of his life, he's a professional poet. The people that were abolitionists and saying we have to end slavery immediately are very few. How did he become connected to that tribe? He had written, Longfellow had written The Song of Hiawatha, um, which was this huge best selling book. Um, and it was based upon um, the sort of hodgepodge of Native American myths and stories and that kind of stuff. And that he had created them or crafted them sort of through his own mouth. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because Longfellow actually gets, Longfellow gets, gets heavily criticized in the 20th century, as you would imagine. And also, if you read it, it ends kind of with like Hiawatha sailing off into the, the sun saying, oh, the white men are here now, they'll take care of everything. Ralph Waldo Emerson, who was another of Longfellow's very good friends, he said that he couldn't believe that Longfellow found anything useful out of those yeah. savage stories. Did he have any type of relationship to works of art or literature that came from Africa or African Americans? I don't know. Essentially, if you read poems on slavery, they're pretty interesting. Interesting? Do you think he was familiar with Bill Sweetley? I don't know. People accused her of, of not really being the author. Ooh, oh, look at her. Writing. She can, can write. write. Yeah, yeah, she can read. But they did seem to really be impressed by, by her. Now, we're going to talk about Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's daughter. Alice Longfellow was involved in the progressive era causes of moral social reform in the early 20th century of expanding the vote to create or expanding democratization you have things like um, the the initiative for ballot proposals and things like mm -hmm. that are coming in you have that's when you start getting direct election of US senators versus um, being chosen by state legislatures the idea of moral perfectibility mm -hmm. and that led them down in this road of into eugenics, you know, trying to perfect society. Um, they continued those sterilization laws into like the, well into the 20th century. She was very much involved in helping the poor. She's a big supporter of education. Um, it just was this weird little dark side of, of progressivism. Yeah. Um, but eugenics. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it's not so little. I'm not sure if Alice would have necessarily believed in eugenics. She's in Italy when Mussolini comes to power. She's pretty fairy formal because, you know, the trains are running on time. She dies in 1928, in fairness. So she, before 
before things really get ugly, right? She's yeah. not seeing that so much. Not seeing that as much? Then she must have been blind because she had slaves herself. I chose this site because of the controversial meaning of the celebration of George Washington as a political hero and his role in the development of the concept of freedom in a country that was developed primarily by slavery. He did free his enslaved people in his will, but only after his wife died, and that was primarily because she wanted to use them. Garrett Clark was constantly trying to rationalize racist thoughts and wanted to pretend that owners cared about their slaves, specifically when it came to asking him questions about owner a judge and Washington's personal slave whom he allowed to have a lover. Clore was able to admit that Washington did not want to negotiate with owner a judge because he felt disrespected that she had attempted and successfully escaped from slavery. He felt disrespected that she didn't value her life with the Washingtons enough to stay.